Well, this morning, um, I don't know if it's the three cups of coffee or if it's the music selection, but I feel, I feel kind of amped up. And so we're talking about things that the early church was committed to that it would be wise for us to pay attention to. If the, if the early church, if the original church, the people closest to the source did this, it's probably a good idea for us to do it too. And so this morning, um, I, I guess I'm apologizing in advance, I feel like I feel like in, in my heart I have a, almost a prophetic uh, attitude this morning. So please, I'm, I'm telling you that in advance. I want to say some things about worship this morning that I think are really biblical and are important for us to hear. And the truth is, when you hear that we're talking about worship, you know, automatically we're so consumeristic, we start thinking about our preferences in worship. Anybody do that? Like, I'm not the only one. Like, that is so, that is so the wrong spirit because like, it's not about me and it's not about my preferences, which by the way, if I did everything I wanted to do, probably at least half of you wouldn't like that, you know? But stop for a second and think about if we did everything the way you wanted to, there might be more than half of the people here who don't like that. It's really not about us. And yet, we can't avoid the fact that we've grown up in the most consumeristic culture in the world that we think worship is about us. And so it's important for us to kind of hit the reset button on worship. And if I, if I sound maybe a little more prophetic in saying, guys, this is what it's supposed to be. It's, it's, it, I'm saying it to my own heart because I grew up in the same culture that you do and I need to hear this as well. And so as you uh, follow along in your, um, your worship bulletin, we're going to look at Acts 2, 42 through 47. We've done that over the last several weeks. But then we're going to transition rather quickly to Psalm 95 to see kind of a biblical theology of what worship really should be like. So I begin with this question, was the early church committed to worship? Now, I ask the question in Scripture very quickly in Psalm 40, uh, Psalm, uh, I'm sorry, Acts 2, 42 through 47, provides a very quick clear and resounding answer, yes, the early church was committed to worship. Listen to what Acts 2, 42-47 says. <clears throat> and they, the early church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common." And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. That sounds exactly like the passage that Clint read this morning. They were taking care of each other. Verse 46, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, there's a number of things that I think are very interesting for us to see right here in this passage. It, it, it doesn't say specifically that they were devoted to worship. It says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. So how in the world can, can we say with any kind of authority that the early church was devoted to worship when it doesn't make the list specifically of the four things that it mentions in Acts 2.42? Well, I would, I would actually tell you that I think all of the descriptors of the four things that they were devoted to happened within the context of what we would call church. Where do you get the apostles' teaching? You gather together with God's people. It's not like there was an itinerant door-to-door apostles' teaching salesman that came to your house and then to your house and then to your house. There was a gathering in which they, they, they studied the Bible and there was preaching um, or studied the Bible that they had, what they'd heard about Jesus' teachings and maybe fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. So the, the, the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, I think, certainly describe church life. I would even say, and you, you heard me kind of defend this a couple of weeks ago, I think the breaking of bread in 42 is the Lord's Supper. Um, and I think the prayers are set times of prayer that I think would really kind of describe what a church service looked like. The breaking of bread was the Lord's Supper, which is a church ordinance, not a personal right. Just because you've got juice and crackers at home doesn't mean that you are taking the Lord's Supper in the privacy of your own home. The prayers, I believe, were set Jewish hours of prayer. If you've ever had the chance to travel to a, a Muslim country, 
You know it multiple times throughout the day, you're going to hear what sounds like a really bad bullhorn going off all, around all corners of the city, calling devout Muslim men especially to prayer. And in the same way, uh, the Jewish people had set formalized hours where they would pray. And so early Christians took their lead from the Jewish community. There were set hours of prayer in which they prayed together. Now, all of this, I think all of these descriptors in verse 42 are descriptions of church fellowship, teaching, uh, breaking of bread, and prayers. But this is reinforced very clearly in verse 46. It says in verse 46 that day by day they attended temple together. They, they went to a religious building daily. Now, that may have just been for the set times of prayer, but the ultimate expression in verse 47, they, they attended the temple day by day, and then verse 47 says, they praised God and had favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Uh, verse 47 describes their praise. And so church life looked very different back then, but I think we can say without equivocation that the early church was devoted to worship. I think the context in verse 42, and then the explicit statements in verse 47. And so our goal is not to photocopy them, but to faithfully follow the principles and examples that they sent. The early church was committed to worship, and we should be committed to it as well. Now, you find something about their worship, and specifically about the frequency of their worship. What did you see about the frequency of their worship? It said it was daily. They went to the temple daily. So here's a question. Should we, as believers in 2024, do daily worship? Now, that doesn't mean we're going to do what we're doing on Sunday every day of the week. Like, it doesn't mean that we're going to have Bible classes in a formal worship gathering where we officially gather together. But yes, we should do daily worship. And I would argue that your weekly worship is... Uh, W-E-A-K, week, if you don't do daily worship. Like, if you worship daily, you are priming the pump for coming. You're, you will, I guarantee this, you will sing louder. You might even close your eyes, and you might find yourself, uh, this is not, I'm going to get in trouble for this, you might find yourself Baptist dancing in the pew, swaying back and forth, because you're not just singing with your lips, you're singing with your heart. I mean, how, how wonderful, I almost, I almost said how marvelous, how marvelous to sing about how marvelous God is. You know, we, we just sang about, you know, God, you do great things. Do you believe that? Then, then why does it take us so long to say, hey, anybody have something to praise God about this week? And we all look down, we twiddle our thumbs, but then you say, hey, anybody got prayer requests? And a hundred hands go up around the room. Like, we know what we want. Santa Claus, here's my wish list. Here's all the things that I want you to do for me. But then when it comes time for us to actually say what God has done, we sing about the great things, we don't talk about it. And so what, what would daily worship look like? Really simple, okay? You, you ready to be underwhelmed? Word, prayer, song. Can you read? Yes. Can you pray? Yes. Can you sing? I don't know about that one. But you know what? The Bible says it's supposed to be a joyful noise, not a beautiful noise. And so don't allow the criticism that you get related to the sound that comes out of your mouth to be something that keeps you from worshiping God privately, daily. So, sometimes in my devotional habit, my, my devotional book uh, 99% of the time is the Bible. Um, maybe not 99% of the time, maybe a little bit less than that. But the, the times that it's not, you know what it is? It's the hymnal. Because those songs are so filled with the word and they put into kind of more emotional expression, maybe what, maybe what my heart needs. And so um, singing, uh, enjoying the word, communicating with God in prayer is everything that you need to do to model the principle of daily worship without having to come to the building. We should absolutely be committed to daily worship. Uh, I love two verses we're going to look at, Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. It just talks about how we do our daily worship. 
It, it doesn't involve an offering, and it doesn't involve greeters, and it doesn't involve Bible classes, but it involves this. Do not be drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Like that's your, that's your daily worship. It's to say, God, I'm leaking. Fill me back up with your Spirit. Verse 19, addressing one another. There's the community. Addressing one another. How? In psalms and hymns, in spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. You know why he says um, singing and making melody in your heart? Because for some of you, it's really hard for you to do it with your vocal cords. So if you can't do it with your voice, do it with your heart. That, that should not hinder you at all. Um, because when you're, when you're worshiping God privately, who cares what you sound like? It's a sweet sound to the Lord. And heck with everybody else who's criticizing you. And then it ends, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If your daily worship doesn't make you of benefit to your fellow Christians, you're doing something wrong. It it should result in a praise that bubbles out of your heart and it can't stay there. It's got to come out of your mouth and it's got to be an encouragement to other believers. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says that we should be careful not to forsake our gathering together. But every day, here it is, um, let us consider how to stir one another up. Not, this is not like you're causing trouble. You're not stirring them up because you're poking at them. This is stirring them up in a good way. Consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Here's a question. Hebrews written 2,000 years ago. Is the day drawing near closer for us or for them? It's closer for us. That means every believer needs more encouragement. More and more, especially as you see the day drawing near. Christians today need more encouragement than I believe Christians 2,000 years ago did. And it's not because... There's anything quantitatively different or qualitatively different. It's just a different. It's a different day and age. There's more distractions, and so our our weekly, our daily worship is supposed to be something very private and personal. But it overflows into something communal where we're encouraging one another, as Hebrews ten twenty four and twenty five. Part of our fellowship that we talked about last week is daily encouragement. You need to be encouraged in the Lord so that you can be an encouragement in the Lord to somebody else. It doesn't stop with you. So, let's talk a little bit here about whether the Bible has anything to say about our weekly worship. We've seen that the early church was committed to worship. It's not laying there right on the surface. You've got to peel the onion just a little bit to see that in Acts chapter 2. We've seen that just as they were committed to daily worship, we should be too. And our weekly worship will be better worship if we worship daily, personally, privately, But does the Bible have anything to say about our weekly worship? Let me encourage you to turn to Psalm 95. And for our final point, you see five sub-points that I'm going to uh, go through rather quickly. I'll make some some kind of uh, uh, some some points related to each of these. But I, I want you to see that the precedent for New Testament worship is Old Testament worship. Psalm 95 is one of my favorite psalms because in 11 verses, he says, I I think everything we need to know about what is most essential for Christian worship. So listen, listen as I read Psalm 95 in its entirety. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to to proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their hearts. 
and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Five quick points that I think help us to get a biblical theology of worship right. Number one, in verses one and six, we see that we are invited to worship. We're invited to worship. Oh, sing, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Verse 6, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. It's good for us to know that we are invited and we are welcome to participate in this. Um, one, of my, one of my concerns is like that we've become so consumeristic, and I hope you know what I, I mean by that. It's the idea that the customer is always right. Okay, so think about, think about that proposition, the customer is always right, applied to the church we would never be able to decide what we're going to sing. We would never be able to decide what book of the Bible we're going to study. We would never be able to decide what passage of Scripture to pick because all y'all would pick the book of Revelation every time. We would never study another book besides the book of Revelation. Everybody wants that. They want the thing that is kind of scintillating. It's, it's, it's interesting. And so like, you, you take that idea that the consumer is always right. You apply that to the church. You destroy any kind of sense of corporate identity. We become islands of one. And my fear is, and, 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 and please hear this the right way. So I think consumerism is connected to criticism in the sense that like you've put yourself in Simon Cowell's seat while the people on the stage do their thing, preaching, reading, singing, and you're back there with your scorecard determining whether you're going to hit the buzzer to pass them on to the next round. I can't tell you. I, I hear this all the time, and I understand what it means. I don't know how to address it. Is when, when, when people, and especially young people, though I see it with older people too, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? You ever, have you ever heard that? Have you ever expressed it? I have. You know what's in it for you? You get to worship the king together with all of the redeemed, why would you pass up that invitation? So think about this. Think, think about this. Let's say we all go home. Well, I, I can't do it like that because then it, it, it rips it of its strength. Let's say you go home, not we all go home. You go home and you find in your mailbox uh, uh, some kind of letter and it's not a normal letter. It's, it's very important. Please open it immediately. And it's from our governor. And he is inviting you, you singularly, to a dinner with him. Now, admittedly, we are so marketed to, automatically I would kind of shake my head and say, what's McMaster want? He's hitting me up for something. He's selling something. Instead of just going, oh my goodness, the governor of our state has invited me to a dinner? You know, you would, you would maybe be dismissive and say, he, this is probably a mass-produced piece and it went to every person in the state of South Carolina. Like, don't, do you share that kind of cynicism or am I the only one? I'd be like, uh, uh. But, what if it was true? What if it was true that he said, you know, once a week, I'm going to invite a South Carolina uh, citizen to come have dinner in my governor's mansion because I want to know what's going on. Man, if that was really what he was doing, how quickly would you pass up that invitation? And I would argue it would probably pr be pretty stupid. That's a Greek word. For you to pass up an invitation to, you know, if, if he was genuinely wanting to connect with people that he leads. And the same, the same point like, comes to our consistency in worship. If you are invited to worship, why would you not show up? Why would you pass on that invitation? Why would you sit in judgment on something that you've been invited to when the, the king is the one who's making the invitation? Now, worship can be done alone. We just said Private worship is a wonderful thing, but it's perhaps best done together. If you've ever watched a football fan, um, they can get into it at home. Like they can, you know, it looks like they got ants in their pants because they're trying to sit down. They can't quite do it. They're, you know, there's an interception, there's a touchdown, there's something. And like, it's not enough to just sit there passively and watch. You want to participate. You want in on the actions. You're going to raise your hands and you're going to jump and you're going to yell. And I would say that in the same sense that that gets amplified when we're with a bunch of Clemson fans or a bunch of USC fans, that worship is perhaps done better together. 
than it is by yourself. And that's not to deny that personal worship can't be awesome and powerful. But worship is not a performance or a concert. It's a communal event that you've been invited to participate in. And let me tell you this. The, the choir that the congregation is, is not quite what it could be if you're not here next week. You know, I'd love it if we shook the windows off the sills because we sang with such gusto because we were all here. And there's an invitation to worship. Number two, worship should be passionate. If you look at verses one and two, there is lots of sound, not noise. Don't, don't ever, well, I got to be careful. I'm, I'm fearful that there are some churches that have turned worship into such a show that it really is noise. But be very careful to call worship noise. There's lots of sound. There's volume. As a matter of fact, one commentator in verses 1 through 4 calls this the vegetarian psalm because there's so many, let us, let us, let us, let us. It's, it's communal. He says, oh come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. There is a lot going on right here. We are invited to sing, to shout, to express our joyful, our our thankfulness, and our joy. And I just wonder if we did like restaurants do, and we paid somebody to be a secret shopper. Like, let's say next week we have a secret worshiper. And it's not anybody that you know. It's someone foreign to our congregation. And their whole purpose was to have a survey that they fill out on what they learned about our church from the way our people worshiped. What would we find out? That we stand up because Chris told us to. We sing because it's the thing that we're supposed to do, but it wasn't really an expression of our heart. Like, what would people get from how we listen to the Word, how we sing the Word, how we pray the Word, how we talk about our our offering? We're invited to uh, sing about how great God is, how marvelous His works are. And not to be something that's hypocrisy, because we don't talk about it the rest of the week. We just do it on Sunday for an hour. Like, it's supposed to be a genuine expression And so often when we talk about music, the thing that we get passionate over is what we want to fight about, not about who we want to sing to. So we ask the question, are you modern or formal, traditional, contemporary, liturgical, contemplative, ancient, future, southern, gospel, gospel gospel-centered, or something else? And we'll be really kind to point you to the next church down the street, because if you're not what we are, we don't want you. That's not the way that we're... That's not the passion that we're supposed to have for a style or a cultural expression. Our passion is to be for God. He is God. We are the sheep of His hand. And too often we get hung up on the cultural expression of worship and we forget the passion for the person. And we get connected to our idiosyncrasies. So before you stick in the muds, get upset about too much enthusiasm... I mean, the point is, worship should be passionate. And automatically, listen, I know that for for you white knucklers, when it comes to worship, you know, when we say passion, that's going to set you off here a little bit, okay? I want you to see in verse 6 that that passion is tempered by reverence. So verses 1 and 2, it's loud, it's noisy, it's passionate. But verse 6, he says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. What do you see there? You see reverence. It's like, is there a way to be passionately reverent? That's a weird word, like jumbo shrimp, you know, because we tend to think that passion and reverence, they don't, they don't coexist. But there is to be a passion for God expressed in what he says here is noisy, joyful, thankful sound. But there's this reverence where we're bowing in our hearts before God in marveling at the great things that he has done. So listen, don't don't be down on passion because it's passion and reverence and we need a balance of both of those. So consider everything that the Bible has to say. We need both. 
So the question is, what kind of God merits this kind of lose your voice singing as loud as you can so that you can bow before him in your hearts because he is your creator? What kind of God deserves this kind of worship? Well, verses 3 through 5 makes it very clear that our worship should be focused on God. Verses 3 through 5 says, Hey, he is a great God and he's a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. We sing a song and we teach it to our kids. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the He's got the Marianas Trench in his hand. He's got Mount Everest in his hand. He's got Jupiter and Mars in his hands. He's got the entire universe in his hands. Everything. And he's trying to say, can you forget about your mortgage when you come to church? Can you forget about your health condition when you come to church? Can you forget about the argument you've had with your spouse or your kids when you come to church? Can you forget about uh, home repairs (laughs) or lunch on Sunday afternoon when you come to church? He is a great God. He's got the whole world in his hands. Your plumbing problems or your mortgage problems, your car payment, He's got that too. He's got it all. And so I love the titles. He's called the Lord. He's called a rock. He's called, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, good grief, I can't remember it. The rock. Dwayne Johnson. He's a plagiarizer. He was never the rock. God was always the rock. He's called a great God. He's called a, a great king. And we love this new focus in verses 4 and 5. He is the creator and he is above all. If, if what you are passionate about in worship is not God, you are an idolater. If you're focused on a style, I, I hate to say this because I love you, but you are an idolater if you, if you allow a stylistic issue to be more important than what we're focused on, which is not a style, it's not an instrument, it's not a style of music. Our focus is on our great God and great King who is above everything else and everything in all of existence is in His hands. Like that is what we're supposed to be focused on, not ourselves. Verses 6 and 7 make it clear that one of the byproducts of worship is worship should make us humble. How many of you don't need that lesson? Okay, good. Thank you for not raising your hand. Verses 6 and 7 says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Man, what do you bow down to? Nothing, right? Like, that's a sign of subjection, submission. I'm not bowing down. I'm not going to, you know, the, the, um, I'm watching the lo- new Lord of the Rings television show. And so the big baddie, Sauron, is in a, he's in a disguise. He doesn't look like they would think a bad guy. He looks like a good guy. And he's kind of aligning with the, the orcs, who are the, the, the bad people in the land. And uh, he's deceiving them because he's going to take over. And they say, I need you to pledge your allegiance. And he says, I pled, pledge my allegiance to whatever the guy's name is. I haven't memorized it because he's going to be dead probably in two episodes. You know? But like, he's making Sauron pledge allegiance. And he says, I, I pledge allegiance. And he says, no, at my feet. And he makes him put his head down right next to his toes. You can see they're nasty toes, nasty feet. And they're not wearing shoes. And the idea is he can just kind of put his put his foot right on the back of his neck to kind of demonstrate his superiority. The Bible says we bow down. We kneel before the Lord our maker. And you're not going to like the, the Hebrew word for bow down. The word for bow down is what a subservient dog does to its master. So I have three dogs. I have lots of experience with dogs. And I have a dog that I think ate an entire pizza that I ordered for my son yesterday. I was not very happy with that. So I come in and I see what's going on and I go, Jackson! You know what he does? He's a big dog. Puts that tail between his legs and automatically he gets in this servile position like 
please don't hit me. Well, I'm not going to hit him. But like he knows that there's displeasure in what he does is he bows at my feet and he wants to lick my toes. I'd shoes on. But the idea is that he's bowing down. He's recognizing, oops, I messed up. And I have a master that I've displeased. And I'm going to take the appropriate posture to show that I'm learning. And I'm putting myself in a position of submission. And if worship doesn't make you humble, you're not doing it right. If you go out of here full of yourself and not full of God, you've done it wrong. He's our great shepherd. And it humbles us, not only that God created us, but he redeemed us. We are in his hands. He is never in ours. If you think God is in your hands, you've got another lesson to learn. But like a loyal dog kisses the feet of its master, that should be at least, maybe not the action that we do in worship. That would be weird. Like, please don't act that out in worship. But the posture of your heart should be one of of humble submission. You should walk out of here saying, God, how can I live for you better? How can I be a better disciple this week? Our worship should be God-exalting, not self-exalting. And here's what's so humbling. Not only is he the powerful creator, he is a personal creator. He is our shepherd. We are the sheep of his pasture. We are the flock of his hand. He did this personally for us. You say, what's, what's in this for me? What did God do for me? Well, he made you. He provides for you. He cares for you. He called you if you're a Christian. He regenerated you. He died for you. He enlightened you. He unblinded you. He revived you. He sustains you. He forgives you. He sanctifies you. He will raise you up and he will glorify you. That's what God did for you. Fifth and finally, verse, the second part of verse 7 through 11, worship should encourage our repentance. It takes, a, it takes a decided, it makes a decided change in tone. Second part of verse 7, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, is it Meribah, as in the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test, when they put me to the proof, though they had seen my work for 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, these people go astray in their heart. And they have not known my ways, therefore I sworn my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. That sounds terrible. And yet the point is this, we are being encouraged to repent. It emphasizes God's role as judge against those who exalt themselves over him. Hey, I want you to go this way. No, we want to go back to Egypt. Well, now you are opposing God. You are exalting yourself over what he said, and that's sin. God is passionate for his glory. And he won't share it with you. And I would just recommend, it's not smart to test or try your powerful creator. If he's got the whole world in his hands and he's telling you what to do, please listen. Worship is serious business, but it can be dangerous if you don't at least bow to him in your heart. If you bow to him in your heart, you will obey him with your actions. If you don't bow in your heart, you'll never obey. And so God wants our lips and our lives to match up. What we say we believe and how we should live should be consistent. But the point is this. He uses a historical um, reference to the wandering in the wilderness when the people rebelled against God. And God said, I judge them because they didn't repent. And so even in the judgment, in this kind of dark mood, he, he's, he's saying something very definitive, but he's also saying something else that is behind the words. He's saying our failure, what we do, is not the end of the story. Repentance always clears the slate. Those who repent, don't get judged. Because the judgment for our sins doesn't fall on us, it falls on our Savior. We have one who stands in our place to atone for our sins. These verses are a warning with an awesome upside. We are warned not to harden your heart. That implies repentance. If you make your heart soft, you will not experience the terror of falling into the hands of the living God. And he's saying, if there are ways that you are living that aren't consistent with my lordship, then then deal with it. Today, have life. Choose life, not death. 
And I think most ultimately, even though Jesus is not in the passage, we know that our salvation comes not from sheeps and goats and bulls that we offer as sacrifice, but the once and for all sacrifice of His Son in our place that we might be forgiven. That drama plays out day after day as we constantly come to God and say, God, I I need your forgiveness. I know I'm redeemed. I'm still not always living the way that I should. Please help me with this. These are things that worship should do. We're invited to worship. We should be passionate about worship. We should be focused on God. It should humble us, and it should make us repent. So some questions for us to conclude with. Worship is more than singing. But specifically, what does our singing and how we participate communicate? Do we sing like we really believe it? Or do we sing like it's a boring obligation? Corporate worship can be a powerful witness. But if you sing like you don't care, it can be a very damaging witness too. Why would anybody want to come to a church that sings like everybody's doing it out of obligation? I wouldn't want to be a part of a church like that. If a visitor only listened to our singing, would they know the gospel? I have a quick answer for that. Yes, I believe they would. But the truth of what we sing and the manner in which we sing it should line up. If God is marvelous, He's done great things, that should be reflected in how loud we sing. That should be reflected in how passionate we sing. How do you prepare for worship? Besides just showing up on Sunday morning, is there anything that you do to get your heart ready to worship the King? What attitude should you have when we are learning a new song? Is it about your preferences or a new beautiful truth that it's expressing about our great God? Please, please believe me in this. The beauty of who God is has not been exhausted in all the songs that have been written already, or we would never need to write another song. God is so incredible. We could fill up every library in the world with millions of new songs about who God is and still not exhaust the beauty of who He is. I hope you believe that. And I hope that you, you see the opportunity to sing a new song as a new opportunity to hit maybe a different note, just a little bit different way about the beauty of who God is. Worship should motivate us to cherish God's presence. And its ultimate result, I think this comes from Bob Coughlin, worship should motivate us to cherish God's presence. Like, man, what a privilege to be in God's presence. To encourage us to live for God's glory, what we do the rest of the week, and to embolden us to proclaim the good news. Is it doing these things in your heart? Because if it's not, we need to ask God to purify our worship. Would you pray with me, please?